right about now. now, now. One, one, two, two, three, three, hit me! Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Right About Now podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Small, and I am thrilled that you've come along for the ride today. We've got a great show. I know I always say that, but this one's really special. My guest today is Claire Pooley, who is an English author of the new book, The Authenticity Project. Claire knows a thing or two about what it is to dig deep inside and find your authentic voice, your authentic person, and sometimes face some hard truths. In 2015, if you were to look at Claire Pooley, you would probably say she had a pretty great life. She had a good job at an advertising agency. She was in a happy marriage. She had three healthy children. But all was not as it appeared at all. By that stage, I had come to the rather reluctant realization that um, I had to quit drinking because I was um, chronically addicted to alcohol and uh, I was drinking about a bottle of wine a day, uh, actually probably two a day at weekends. And I was I was in quite a bad way. So it was really affecting my mental and physical health. It was affecting my relationships with my children. It was, uh, you know, it was having a very negative impact on my life. She was an alcoholic. But in her prim and proper English society, she was terrified to admit it. But that all changed in the form of her writing a blog about her addiction. At first, she wrote it anonymously. But eventually, she decided to put her name to it. That blog became so popular that it became a memoir and won her international recognition for her honesty and her humor and her insightfulness about alcoholism. Well, she is back. And this time, she decided not to write a memoir about herself, but to write a novel a novel called The Authenticity Project. And it is a fascinating story told from a number of different perspectives with the basic premise being this. What would happen if, instead of pretending to be perfect, we shared the truth? What magic might happen then? And that's a pretty good writing prompt, and it's a prompt that Claire presents to six different characters who must answer this question in an honest way. And I'm not really doing the book justice, but it is really an interesting book. And I was thrilled to have Claire come on the show to talk to me about it. I called her up in London, England. It was 8 a.m. at my time and 8 p.m. her time. So she was basically in the future, which was fascinating in itself. So, without further delay, I present you with my interview with Claire Pooley. Claire Pooley, welcome to the Right About Now podcast. Thank you so much for having me on today. I'm so excited. Let's talk about your life. It's such an interesting life and your evolution. And and I really want to talk about your new book, The Authenticity Project. But if you can just sort of take us back a little bit, Describe sort of like who you were in 2015, as opposed to who you are now and kind of what you were going through at that time in your life. Two thousand and fifteen was the worst year of my life um, mm. because by that stage, I had come to the rather reluctant realization that um, I had to quit drinking because I was chronically addicted to alcohol and uh, I was drinking about a bottle of wine a day, uh, actually probably two a day at weekends, mm. and I was 
I was in quite a bad way. So it was really affecting my mental and physical health. It was affecting my relationships with my children. It was, uh, you know, it was having a very negative impact on my life. But the incredible thing is that nobody realized apart from me um, you know because from the outside my life looked pretty perfect you know it was the kids looked happy I looked happy everything looked like it was you know going along swimmingly and if you looked at my Instagram feed or my Facebook feed it would all look great but the reality was was very very different and um, I decided I did I had to quit and my form of therapy was writing so that's when I really started writing again for the first time since I was I was you know in my early 20s and I started with a blog and I wrote in this blog every day what was going on in my life and what I was dealing with and I called it mummy was a secret drinker <laughs> And yes, and that was Definitely. that was effectively my authenticity project. That was yeah. me, you know, telling the truth about my life. And how long had you been drinking like this? Had this been something that a habit that you had or an addiction that you had picked up early in your life? Oh God, it you know it just crept up on me. So I was in advertising for a long time, and that was a, a world that revolved around drink. We had a bar in the office. Oh my you know, I had a, yeah, I had a I had a big expense account which I used to wine and dine clients. That was all part of my job, and uh, you know, so so that didn't help, but. It just crept up. So I started off drinking a large glass of wine at the end of the day to relax and chill out. And it's like me time thing, you know, Mm -hmm. wine o'clock. And that one glass of wine slowly became two and two became three. And my glasses are really big. Yeah. (laughs) So, So three glasses of wine is a whole bottle. But it I'd never felt drunk because my tolerance just increased very gradually to to the point where I could drink a bottle of wine and it hardly touched the sides. But it did affect me hugely. Affected you in what way? Well, by this stage, I was 28 pounds or 30 pounds overweight. I was a terrible insomniac. I had very bad anxiety, which I didn't realize at the time was also caused by the drinking. Um, And I wasn't a great mum because I was quite shouty and impatient with my kids because often I was, you know, like, you know, you do those bedtime stories at the end of the day. And I would race through my bedtime stories so I could go and pour myself a glass of wine. So I spent a lot of time you know, my life revolved around the drink in a way that really wasn't healthy. Was there a moment when you knew, all right, this is getting out of control. I've lost control of this drinking. Uh, and, and you sort of, you, you, you decide to quit because, I mean, we all know any addiction, it's not easy to quit. And just to sort of one day say, I'm going to stop drinking. It's, it was, was there yeah, a moment? Yeah, there's, there's always, there's always a trigger, isn't there? Yeah. And mine, Mine was a very specific moment. And actually, I turned the blog into a memoir, which was called The Sober Diaries. Mm. And this moment is the first page of of that memoir. And uh, basically, I woke up one morning, it was a morning after a birthday party, and my birthday party, and I had a terrible hangover. And I went downstairs to the kitchen and the kids were making a real noise and I had a really awful headache. And I knew that the only thing that would make me feel better is to have another drink. But I had this hard and fast rule that I never, ever drank before midday because I thought only alcoholics drink before midday and Mm -hmm. I'm not an alcoholic and therefore that's not something I would ever do. And it was 11.30 in the morning. And I opened the cupboard and there was a tiny bit of red wine left in a bottle. And I poured the red wine into a mug so my children couldn't see that I was drinking wine at 11.30. And I drank it and I felt much better almost immediately. And then I looked at my mug and on it, it said the world's best mum. Oh, boy. Actually, in in American, that would be the world's best (laughs) mum. Yeah, it said Um, mum, yeah. Yeah, mum, M-U-M, our our side of the pond. (laughs) And I was so horrified with myself that I haven't had a drink since then. That was that was the last one nearly five years ago. Wow, that is that's amazing. And and there was just that moment that 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 moment of shame. So you were you didn't have a drink, but did you go to rehabilitation? Like, how did you how did you just quit like that? You just Uh, was was so strong a impact that moment had that you were like, I can never be in that person again? Yeah, I mean, my my therapy was was writing. Mm. Um, and what I discovered is once I started writing this blog, just 
putting the words down on the page I found incredibly helpful and initially I started writing it just for me I didn't think anyone would actually find it because I didn't publicize it and I wrote it under a pseudonym and I didn't put it on my social media or anything but you know one day after I'd been writing for about a week or 10 days somebody commented and I thought oh my god there's, (laughs) there's somebody out there And, you know, I started getting messages from people all over the world saying, I feel exactly the same as you do. I'm going through exactly the same as you are. And that was really what got me through is is the power of that community. And actually, that's one of the big themes in, in my novel, The Authenticity Project, is, you know, the power of telling your truth and the community that that can create and how that can completely transform your life. So first of all, it's amazing that people found it. You didn't, in this day and age, you know, you usually have to do all this marketing and people, you know, it, it sort of gives me hope that if you build it, they will, they will come, you know. <laughs> well, you, you know, I, I tell you how people found it in the early days is um, the same way that, that I found other people, which is, you know, everybody um, who has starts to have think they have an issue with alcohol at some point will find themselves often late at night after a few drinks typing into google am i an alcoholic yeah and what would after a while what would happen if people typed into into google am i an alcoholic is they would find my blog yes (laughs) you you had good search engine optimization i guess going there (laughs) what was it that you think that resonated so much about that blog with with all those people Um, The interesting thing about addiction is that, you know, you can be completely different ages, live in completely different parts of the world and from from different backgrounds and so on. And yet addiction treats everybody in a very, very similar way. And I talked about little things that that I was dealing with and other people would say, yeah, I, I do that too. And I thought I was the only one. So to give you an example, one of the things that I remember writing a blog post about was my fear of cashiers. (laughs) <laughs> because I used to worry whenever I went into a shop to buy wine that the cashier was judging me and thinking, oh, wow. oh, that woman was in here yesterday and she bought wine yesterday too. And, you know, and I was really paranoid about it. So I used to rotate the shops I went to. And I, I wrote all about this in a blog post and people all over the world said, I do that too. And then and then I got one message from someone saying, I'm a cashier and I do judge. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't completely wrong. No. <laughs> and also that observation, you know, you make the it's like these superstitions that are these these ridiculous thresholds that you make. Well, I'm not an alcoholic as, as long as I don't drink in front of my children. You know, like yeah. as if that is like somehow like that would be the the sign that you were an alcoholic. So you write I, I'm so interested in this, you know, writing as therapy for you. When did you first discover writing as as a sort of calming therapy for you? Um, well, I, funny enough, you know, I used to love writing when I was a child and I carried on writing a diary every day until my early 20s. And I used to write short stories and send them to magazines mm. and, and they'd send them back again. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I love writing back then. And then life got in the way and, you know, I was, I'd stopped writing for for years and years and years. And almost as soon as I quit drinking, I just had this urge to write and I couldn't tell you where it came from. And what's interesting is, you know, I've talked to so many people now who've quit drinking who say that often the thing that really helps them, actually not just people who are quitting drinking, but people going through any tough time in their lives, often the thing that is really therapeutic is the thing you loved doing when you were a child. Mm. So for me, it was writing. For some people, it might be running or sport, other people, art or just knitting or gardening or, you know, horses, uh, people yeah. have, have all sorts of childhood passions that they forget. And often that's, you know, rediscovering those passions as great therapy. Wow. I'm trying to think of what my therapy, would be. playing asteroid, yeah, no, playing, no, playing Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I used to love to DJ and I still love to DJ. And yes, that is something that, that, that I fall back on sometimes when I'm feeling down or, you know, want to feeling like stressed. I just want to do music stuff. Music is great therapy, too. Yes. Yeah. I know. wish it was writing. You know, here I am, a professional writer. It's interesting because, I, you know, writing when you're a professional, now you're a professional, so it's different. But back then you were an amateur writer. And, 
you know, to me, writing is a little bit stressful because I associate it with work and deadlines and getting things done. And But you were writing kind of for yourself. So there wasn't that exterior pressure that you put on yourself like, oh, people are going to be judging this and this is terrible. You know, all the kind of questions that or the sort of fears that writers have that go through their heads. Did it change for you when it actually became something you were just doing as a personal therapy to something you're actually doing professionally and was being kind of looked at by by others on the outside? Well, you know what? I, I only realized recently that I still do write as therapy. Mm. So, you know, so the, the six main characters in the Authenticity Project all have, all but one of them has a sort of fatal flaw, a sort of central, yeah. you know, issue. So, you know, one is an addict, as I was. One one is um, a bit narcissistic. One is a bit of a control freak. And uh, one is sort of really struggling with motherhood. And I realized, actually, it's my 16-year-old daughter who pointed this out when she read it. She said, you know, Mummy, all of your characters are sort of a bit like you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I realized that they, they are very different from me in all sorts of ways. But, but those flaws that they each have are all, all things that I have to a greater or lesser extent. And writing about them and what was going on in their heads, I think, really helped me come to terms with my own imperfections and... You know, and it made me realize that it's the things, often the things that we, that make us imperfect are also the things that make us really interesting and really human and, and lovable. And each of the characters in the book, you know, I ended up falling deeply in love with because despite, perhaps because of their flaws, they're all really lovely people. Yeah, and I, I, I want to get to the book because it's really interesting and it's such an interesting idea and the way you especially the way you wrote it, I really want to get, get, get do a little bit of a deep dive. I just want to understand a little bit more about this time in your life right before this book, you wrote this book, because there, you were going through a lot at this time. It wasn't just alcohol addiction. You are also diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, yes. Yeah, That as I said, it wasn't a good year. It was a really so, bad year. <laughs> <laughs> so eight months after I quit drinking, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. and And those two things are possibly not unrelated because, you know, there is a big link between alcohol and, and breast cancer, which I had been completely unaware of. But uh, but uh, but there is a, a link. Anyhow, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And, you know, I, I, my, by this point, I was so reliant on writing as a as a form of therapy that the first thing I did before I even told my husband was to write about it, because that was the only way I could uh, I could get it off my chest, so to speak. That's a bit, that's a bit of an unfortunate <laughs> phrase to use in the circumstances. But anyway, so I wrote in my blog what I was feeling and, and you know, what I was going through. And, you know, what was really incredible is I had, you know, all the people who'd been reading my blog and who I had helped, you know, with their alcohol issues um, were you know, the people that got me through that, that time. So, sorry, I always feel a bit emotional when I talk about this, so excuse me. But, you know, so there was one lady, for instance, in Wisconsin, and she told me uh, that she had got her whole church congregation of 250 people to pray for me. Mm. And she'd never met me. She didn't even know my real name. And, you know, I just thought that was such a incredible thing to do, you know, and I would be lying awake in the middle of the night, like sort of 2 a.m., fretting about whether I was going to die while my children were still young. And I would find a message from somebody in Australia, you know, who was on their lunch break saying, you know, telling me their story of, of how they'd recovered from breast cancer and, you know, and sending me, you know, virtual hugs. And it was a really incredible thing. And, you know, all of that came from you know, right, using, using writing as, as, as therapy and, and telling, you know, telling the truth about what I was going through. Mm, that's beautiful. And I, you know, I really do see that compassion and empathy coming through in the authenticity project as well. So I feel like that you carried, you carried that over into that, into that book. Um, cause well, it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because you think sort of nonfiction and fiction are, are very different, di- different, but um, actually, I think I'm not sure I could have written as you know as good a, a novel 
if I hadn't already um, written so much about my own thoughts and feelings, because when you really explore what's going on in your your own head and you get used to writing really authentically ab- about your own experiences it helps it helps you to do the same with fictional characters mm. so i hope that you know the they, the the characters in the book come across as you know as as you real. know really yeah. well rounded real people they, they you do. know and i i miss them you know, <laughs> I lived with them in my head for a long time, and I sort of miss them now they're out in the world. That's the wonderful thing about writing fiction is you have these these people that that you create, and they're they're so real, and they tell you what they think, and you know it's almost like they're in your head, but they really feel like real people, and you, and you're and and they almost yeah. tell you rather than you tell them what to do, they tell you what they're going to do. And and yeah, some, sometimes they surprise you. Yeah. And I mean there's a there's a, a twist in in the novel which I I won't obviously yeah, tell you because it's a real spoiler. But I didn't know that was going to happen myself. And and funny enough nobody has seen it coming and I think the reason they haven't seen it coming is cuz I hadn't even seen it coming. <laughs> well that's the best like, way I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you about that. So the way you map that story out you know, some people write, you know, um, the, 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 the theory of writing only as far as the headlights, you know, in a car can let you mm-hmm. write. And other people really have kind of a mapped out outline and, and you know, still maybe write that way, but a little, at least know where they're going, at least know the destination. But your book is not is written in a very interesting sort of somewhat nonlinear way where the characters come in and out and, and, and you it, it, it I'm just wondering, it's it's complicated in a way, the way that you that you told the story, um, and, mm. and I, I should probably preface this by having you maybe maybe explain just the basic premise of of the authenticity project, and then we can kind of get into it. Yeah, yeah. So so it starts when the owner of a cafe called Monica finds a little green exercise book, a notebook, um, left on a table in her cafe, and on the front it says the authenticity project, and she opens it up just to see if she can work out who it belongs to. And inside it says, everybody lies about their lives and what would happen if you told the truth instead. And she reads the story of an artist called Julian who's 79 years old and he tells... He tells us that he is really lonely um, because his wife died 15 years previously and he's totally isolated. And she decides to try and track him down and make his life better. And she also does what he suggests in the book, which is she writes the truth about her own life and then leaves the book in a wine bar where it's picked up by the next person who is an addict, funny enough, Mm. called Hazard. He's a cocaine and alcohol addict. And the book is passed between six different people and each of them writes a secret in the book. You know, they write the truth about about their lives. And through the book, they all manage to meet each other and form this little community which changes all of their lives. So, yeah, so that's the, the, basic, the basic premise. And the book, yeah. I should say, this little green book is like a garden gnome of the Internet path, you know, kind of goes all over the world. Uh, it brings <laughs> right. It brings people together from all over the world. So that was really interesting. And by the way, just that that um line that you that you that you mentioned that what what he writes, what Julian writes in the book, everyone lies about their lives. What would happen if you shared the truth instead? The one thing that defines you that makes everything else about you fall into place. That is such a good writing prompt. I thought like everybody should just use that as a writing prompt if you ever want to like get into a a story or just kind of get yourself motivated to write. You know, because I it got me thinking. Like, what what is that? What is that authentic? Yeah, and truth? and I would love you know what I I'm st- I'm seeing more and more chat now on social media mm. about the novel, and a, a lot of people are sort of talking about you know I really want to do my own authenticity project, <laughs> and you know yeah. it would be uh, it would be really interesting to sort of see what people would would write when given that that question. Um, and it's an interesting question for you to pose, given your past, and you know you had you know, initially when you were writing and putting it out there, you were anonymous, right? So you didn't want people to know who you were. I'm wondering, yes. why, yeah, I'm wondering why it was so shameful for, especially in this day and age, look, Americans, you know, we're, we're all, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's an English thing. I feel like Americans are like, <laughs> look at me, look at selfies, you know, all this stuff and would put it all over their social media and be like, I'm, you know, I'm struggling, but you know, I'm, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. You know, that kind of thing. And it's, 
but you were anonymous initially. This is way before the Authenticity Project was written. Why why was it shameful for you at first to to write your, um, your truth? You know what? Alcohol addiction comes wrapped up in in a whole load of shame. And um, actually, I did a, a TED TEDx talk. I saw um, that. Yeah. Oh, uh, did you? Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, yeah. So so, and it's called uh, making sober less shameful because I, I wanted to try and break down this stigma because. The, it wasn't just me, you know, and I think things are starting to change. But back then, five years ago, you know, there was so much shame wrapped up in in, in addiction. And, you know, it, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, even the word anonymous sort of implies that yeah. you don't want to tell anybody. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the reason is because if you get addicted to cigarettes, people blame the nicotine. It's like, it's not, you know, it's not your fault you're addicted to cigarettes. It's, they're addictive. Uh, they, you know, it's the nicotine's fault. If you get addicted to alcohol, people sort of blame you. You know, they think there's something wrong with you. Mm. Um, you know, and people talk about normal drinkers and, you know, alcoholics. And, and there's so much negative imagery wrapped up with the whole thing. And, you know, and, and people find it very difficult to put their hands up and say, I haven't, you know, I have, a, I'm addicted to alcohol. I'm a, so, you know, and, and I certainly did. So, uh, so, so yeah, so for a long time I was anonymous and it was, but it was such a relief to finally come, come out, out and say, this is who I am. And was there, was there a moment, uh, just like the moment when you realized you had to quit where you were like, you know what, it's time for me to, to reveal who I am. Yeah, actually, I uh, the the truth is I was slightly outed. <laughs> so <laughs> you're like Banksy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well one of, it was a bit like that. So, <laughs> so one of the the mums that I I know from the school gate, I hadn't realised had found my blog about six months previously, and she'd been reading it avidly, and she'd been discussing it with her husband and saying, "Isn't this funny? This could be." Sort of, you know, this this it sounds just like the sort of person we might actually know, oh <laughs> and goodness. it really was somebody she actually <laughs> knew, and she put two and two together when I told a story in my blog, and then I told the same story at a party, and she realised who I was, and she sent me an email saying, "Are you sober, mummy?" <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and I still remember getting that email, thinking, "Oh my god, I've been sort of, I've been outed," and she. She didn't tell anyone, yeah. but you know, at that stage, I thought this is silly. You know, I've, I've, you know, that I need to. If I, if I carry on being anonymous, it's just propagating the shame thing. And you know, if I want people to see addiction as not being shameful and to be proud of getting sober and you know dealing with life head on, then I need to set an example. So. What was the what was the reaction like when you came out? Was it, you know, because I think we have this fear in our head of what it's going to be like, and then actually the, what the reality is, like you said, you know, this woman in Wisconsin praying, like people are actually more much more compassionate and empathetic than you think they're going to be, or or was yeah. did you did you actually face some kind of judging and you know? Well, well, you know what. I- like everything, I'm a bit all or nothing about yeah. everything. So, so when I came out, I really came out with a bang because I, I got, I published a book. So I took my my blog and I wrote the blog as a as a memoir, um, uh, which is called the Sober Diaries. Mm-hmm. And actually, the publishers described it as Bridget Jones dries out. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's funny because it was all done in diary form. Yeah. Uh, so it's a story of my that first year of not drinking. And for the two nights or so before it came out, I could barely sleep. I was so nervous about it. And not only was it being published, but I was, you know, it was was being serialized in one of the main daily newspapers. It was, I was going to be interviewed on TV, on radio, Mm. you know, all over the place. And it was really terrifying. And actually what I discovered is that Actually, Brené Brown is really interesting on on von, uh, you know when she talks about vulnerability. And I discovered that when you make yourself vulnerable, you know when you're, coin a phrase, authentic about what you're going through, people are really kind, you know. And I hardly, I've the whole time last it was two years ago that book was published, and I've had virtually no trolling or negative comments at all Mm. which is extraordinary and you know I worry that people would call me a bad mother that they call me a lush that they'd sort of you know but I called myself all of those things already so yeah you know nobody's gonna say anything worse than 
<laughs> no, you know, so what are they going to call me that I haven't already confessed to? <laughs> you know? It's interesting. Another thing that comes up to me is that in the Academy Awards, the director for Parasite quoted something that Martin Scorsese said. Thank you so much. When I was young and studying cinema, there was a saying that I carved deep into my heart, which is the most personal is the most creative. That quote was from uh, our great Martin Scorsese. So... <laughs> Um, you know, you, your true art is when you when you really write about your authentic self or what, what's authentic to you. And I think maybe that's why it was coming across as so real, because it was authentic to your experience. And I think so, so many of us are scared or nervous or fearful about writing, a, really writing about what they think or what their, mm. what, what their experience is in it. And then I think when you actually do it, it really that's it comes across as real art. Yeah, and you know what? I don't think I I don't think I would have had the courage to do it if I started off thinking I was going to write a book that other people would read. The the reason it it the only way I was able to do it was because I started writing it just for myself. Yeah, did they? Did you pitch this uh, diary idea around like, or did somebody like did a publisher start reading the blog and say this has to be a book? Um, well, actually, all my uh, a huge number of my readers started saying, "Look, you really should publish this as a book because mm. it would help more people." And um, I did have I had one publisher approach me, but then I pitched it out via an agent. And uh, yeah, I had um, amazingly, I had several publishers interested. Actually, it was I think back then there have been quite a few. It's actually known over in the UK as Quitlit now. <laughs> um, Quitlit. Uh, but, Quit. Oh, quit in, lit. Oh, interesting. Lit. Yeah. So now there's been quite a lot, but back then it was. You were a uh, pioneer. I didn't think there was anything, anything quite like that out there. You know, there were most memoirs about drinking were all about the drinking. You know, and then they, you get to the end and they say, and then I stopped, and now life is fine. I wanted to know what happened next. I was like, well, what happens? You know, what happened when you stopped drinking? How did you do it? What did it feel like? How yeah. long did it take to feel normal again? And so that's why I uh, I wanted to publish it because I thought, you know, that's what people really want to know. You know, they want to know that there is life on the other side. Yeah. And then you, you make an interesting decision. You know, so this book comes out. It's very successful. You get a lot of attention in the media. And then a lot of people in that situation might then sort of go on to become, you know, more of an expert in that field or, or, or kind of talk more about alcohol addiction and getting over it. And, but you actually decided then to go a different route. You decided to write a fiction book, which and that doesn't, that had, deals with alcoholism in some way because one of the characters deals with addiction. But tell me why you made this decision suddenly to shift gears and get into fiction. I got to the point where I felt like I was repeating myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been the blog. I started the blog five years ago, nearly, and you know, and I was still writing regular blog posts. But I felt like I was saying that you know I was starting to say the same things again and again. And you know, that blog is still out there. You know, if if anyone is listening to this who who wants to to uh, to read it you know it's called mummy was a secret drinker and mm. and there are hundreds of blog posts there all free to read but you know i just i just didn't feel like i could keep telling that story, that story. Um, moved but on. at the same time you know i wanted to carry on writing and i wanted to write about something a bit different and the other thing is i mean you know my kids now are when i when i wrote the sober diaries the youngest was six and mm. the oldest was 11 um, and i've one in the middle as well and they were quite young um, whereas now my eldest is 16 and you know if i carried on writing about my life i'm also writing about their lives and I don't really think that's fair. You know, they deserve their own privacy. So, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think I've, I've got to the, the, uh, the, or my children are at the age where it's, they prefer me to write fiction. So long as I don't write really vivid sex scenes. <laughs> <laughs> has has your 16 year old, do you know if, 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 if he or she has read, um, the, the sober diaries? Like have they, is it, yeah, they, has, is it age appropriate yet? Uh, well, um, actually, there's an audio book of it, and 
we all listened to the audio book oh, wow. together on a we were on a long drive up to Scotland and I said to them that I really want you to know what's in this book because at some point other people will read it and they will talk to you about it and it's important that you know and they were great about it they were actually just really proud of me oh that's sweet so yeah, they came to my book launch and and they were so you know I've got a picture of the three of them standing there, sort of holding copies of my book, just beaming. You know they were sort of really really proud of me. So yeah. So you move on now. Where did the idea for the authenticity project come from? Uh, well, you know it all came from that really. Is is you know I started thinking well, if telling the truth about your life can cause such incredible things to happen what might happen if other people did it? So so that's what really led to the idea of Julian's little notebook. You know, he, he tells the truth about his life in a notebook rather than in a blog and leaves it in this cafe. And then it encourages other people to do the same. And and I just, I was really interested in in the sort of, you know, the ripple effects that that might have in in the same way that, that uh, you know, that telling my story had had sort of incredible ripple effects. So, you know, the book touches on all sorts of tough topics like addiction and loneliness and grief and reliance on social media and all those sorts of things. Yeah. But ultimately, it's really uplifting because it's all about the magic that happens when, when you know, you, when communities come together and and uh, people are kind to each other and people are honest with each other. And you mentioned social media. You know, Monica has this, one of the characters has this, it, I think she's the character who when she sees, you know, pictures of people and their babies or, or you know, pictures of people pregnant, the, the famous center of Facebook pictures like, eh, I'm having a baby. Like she gets, yeah, there's a yeah. twinge of jealousy. And I think that's a very yeah. honest reaction that people don't really talk about. I mean, it's coming out now a little bit more, but how f- depressed Facebook and Instagram makes people, you know, mm. to see to see other people so happy. And and the, and the truth is, they're not really that happy. As no, you, as you, you, you were there, right? Yeah, I mean, we all curate our, our social media feeds, you know, we all make it look as, as gorgeous as possible. And, you know, and we know that we're doing that, but we look at other people's curated media feeds and we think they're real, you know. We, yeah. So so we judge other people's our insides by other people's outsides, if, if you see what I mean, um, yeah. which makes us all really unhappy. And and actually, I think hopefully what, what the novel will do is get people thinking about that actually that isn't life, you know, every Everybody is, you know, everybody is dealing with something. Um, nobody's life is perfect. And, you know, and when you realize that, it does make you a lot, a lot more grateful for, for your own, your own life. Yeah. And there's, there's a moment actually, you know, a part, about halfway through the book where uh, Monica, who, as you say, is, is sort of, she's a, a feminist and she is very, you know, she's a business owner and she's fiercely independent. And so she feels really you know, conflicted about the fact that actually she just really wants to find love and she really wants to be a mum. And there's, I think a lot of women struggle with that tension. Yeah. Um, And there's a moment where she's in her cafe looking out and Alice, the young mother who's really struggling with motherhood and she's in her, you know, she's only in her her 20s and she's finding being a mum really tough. And she's looking at Monica thinking, I wish I had that life. And Monica is looking at her thinking, I wish I had her life. And we do that so much, you know, we we envy each other. And that's just not so it's not healthy. So I want to get back to this question that I had uh, sort of started asking and then forgot that I had asked it, which is how did you (laughs) how did you map out the story here? Because it seems like a lot of things connect at the end. And, you know, did you have like an outline? Do you have a whiteboard? How did you how did you map it out? Oh, you know, uh, it's funny because I don't write anything down before I start, but mm. I plan it in my head. Right. Um, and, you know, I I had this idea right from the beginning. I knew roughly where the story was going and I knew where it would end. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you use the um, the analogy that I, I love earlier. And I can't remember who first coined it, but the one of the car oh. driving through fog and the headlights. Yes. You know, the, the idea is that, you know, you know where the road is going. But at any point in time, you can only see as far as the headlights, yeah. in, you know, in the fog. And and that was very much how I wrote it. So I knew what the overall road was, but the story sort of unfolded in more and more detail as I started along along that, that road. 
for me, I, I have to leave enough flexibility for magic to happen because you know if, if you try and plan it all out at the beginning before you know your characters then you know you the, you make your character you could end up making your characters do things that that don't feel natural yeah and um, well, what way i like to write is to get to know the characters and to develop them more and more and then you discover what they feel like doing which is sometimes different from what you expect them to do yeah so you, you're writing your characters in your head or creating your characters in your head. Is that how you did it? Did you start with the characters? Did you say, okay, here are the, here are the six characters that, you know, and these are their flaws and this kind of, did you, in your head, did you sort of know who each one was before you even started writing? Yeah, I, I knew I knew roughly who they were, but but what I find interesting about the whole writing process is that as you go along, they become more and more and more defined. So when I get to the end, I then have to go back to the beginning and rewrite the beginning bits. Now I know them better, if you see what yeah. I mean. Yeah. Because they 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 become their own people, and um, you know you find out you find out their backstories, yeah, their backstory. and you know all and and their little their little habits, their little quirks, and you know and and yeah. So by the end, they're much much more well-rounded people than they are at the beginning so that's that's and that's where the editing process is so crucial because you have to go back and rewrite yeah what's the hardest thing about writing for you because it seems like uh, you enjoy it so much and it's therapy but there must be moments when you're like i hate this <laughs> <laughs> slam no, you know your computer what? i i don't think i ever hate it i think the what i find tricky is self-confidence so mm you know, because I got very used to writing just for myself. And I find it very difficult to stop second guessing what other, you know, what my editor might think, or, yeah. or my, you know, little what, voice what in your readers head. might think. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, and when you're writing, there are times when you think, oh, I'm a, I'm a genius. And this is all brilliant. And then the next day, you sort of think, God, oh, this is all terrible. And no one's ever going to want to read it. And I should never write another word. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I go from flip flop from one of those states to the other on a regular basis. And and that's what I find hard is, is, you know, trying to keep up the sort of self confidence and, and I, to try and forget who, you know, forget, sometimes you have to forget that anyone else is going to read it and just write what you really want to write. How do you, um, yeah, I was going to ask how you push through that, you know, that voice of that editor or the voice of the, the I'm a I, fake, I, I was good yeah. at, I was good at memoirs, but fiction, what am I doing? You know, <laughs> yes, that, I'm sure that I thought probably that. came in, you know. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, I, I think the only way to get through that is to think, look, it doesn't matter if, you know, I'm enjoying writing this anyway. And even if nobody else ever reads it, it won't have been a waste of time because I've had fun doing it. And that for me is the only way to, to push through it. If I, if I let myself worry too much about whether it's going to be a success, I, I end up frozen, <laughs> frozen in the headlights. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a bit of a writing ritual? Is there a way you, you write every day or is it kind of just when you feel inspired you write? Yeah, I do have a ritual. I, I, and it's, it's, I guess it's, it would have been different if I was still drinking because when I, when I stopped drinking, I started going to bed much earlier and getting up much earlier. So these days I wake up at about five o'clock in the morning and I wake up really energetic and clear headed. Um, and I'm still grateful every day. I don't have a hangover. <laughs> yeah. And I write then I write first thing in the morning and I find that time really, for me, it's a magical creative mm. time. And I've, I find that if I have plot if I'm trying to work out a plot or I'm trying to you know I'm, I'm trying to come up with an original story I often do that in the middle of the night when I'm half asleep so because there's something about being almost in a dream state where you're able to think much more laterally and in yeah. a much more interesting fashion than you know I couldn't sit there and think right I'm now going to come up with an idea <laughs> you know, it, doesn't, <laughs> right, it doesn't work it doesn't, that way it doesn't work no it, I, I think actually if you're if you're half asleep, you you can come up with some extraordinary things. Not all of them are great, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So but, but, and do you write them down? Oh you, you write God, them down before okay. you forget. I always forget. I, I'm like, you know, especially I'll dream an idea that at least in my dream seems like an amazing idea. But then I, as soon as I wake up, I forget what it was. And I'm so frustrated because I'm like, I had it. I had it. And now it's gone. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> and the problem is if you... 
get up at, to write it down, then you're so wide awake you can't get back to sleep again. <laughs> right. So, so it's a real so. So I, I try and make myself remember it so I can, uh, you know, I, I've still got it in the morning, and I, I lose some of them as well. But I hope that actually, if they're any good, they'll come back again at some point. <laughs> so you write very early in the morning for a few hours, two or three hours, or do you, do yeah, you set so a goal? Yeah, I write. I write between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. Wow. and then I take the kids to school um, and then I come back and uh, reread what I've written and sometimes it's terrible <laughs> and sometimes it's quite good. And then uh, and then later on in the day I edit. So okay. so I do the original writing early and uh, and I do edit after that. I, I just do editing. How much do you find that you need to edit? Do you find your first drafts are pretty good or is it just a just a facsimile of what actually it's going to end up being. Oh, no. Um, you know, have you read uh, Bird by Bird? Oh, I love Bird um, by Bird. Yeah. Oh, God. A best, yeah. best book about writing ever. Um, and um, in uh, Bird by Bird, there's a chapter called Shitty First Draft. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that chapter really helpful because it just gave, you know, made me realize that, um, you know, and everybody writes terrible well most people write terrible first drafts and that's just part of the process right. so so my first drafts are very sketchy they're very short um you know so the first draft of the authenticity project was 55,000 words which is you know not a full length novel and then so it's almost like you know when an artist is doing a painting and they draw a sketch first so you know you know, you get all your perspective right and you know what you're what you're looking at. And then once you've got the sketch, you can go and layer in the color and the depth and the, you know, and, and the emotion. Mm. And and that's the way I write. I write a sketch first, quite fast and quite short. And then I go back and I layer on all the the color and the depth and the tone and and uh, the character. Do you write linearly? Do you do you write the story as it unfolds, or do you, do you write little sections and then kind of pull? It yeah, I, I I write it. I write the first draft in a sort of linear, very yeah. sort of you know. I I feel almost like it feels almost like I have to get it down as quickly as possible before it goes away. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and then mean. I go back and I think, okay, now what have I got here? And then I can see the whole thing and I can. I can start playing with it. And other people do it the other way around. I think other people work to work almost like a sculptor where you put a block of clay on the table and then you chisel you chisel around it until you reveal something special. Yeah. And so they might start with a draft that's 120,000 words and then chisel away to 90 whereas I start with 55 and and then sort of layer it on until I end up with with 90. Yeah. So Let's talk about authenticity because it's a little bit of a theme of what we're talking about and certainly the name of your book. You know, when you're writing a memoir, if you're doing it right and you really are being honest, of course, it's going to be authentic. But it's what did you find it harder to be authentic when you're writing fictional characters? Like, how did you find their authenticity? I, I don't think I could have written those characters if I hadn't already written a memoir because, you know, I, I was so used to exploring you know, inner feelings and the difference between the way we portray ourselves to other people and who we are inside, that it became much easier to do that with fictional characters. I don't think I could have written the book in the same way if I hadn't started with nonfiction. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and I, I, it's funny. It's the tricky thing because I, I write it, the, the Authenticity Project is written from the perspective of six different people. Right. And, you know, I started feeling... You know, do, do you remember years ago there was there was this a uh, true story published about a woman who had multiple personalities, and I can't remember what it was called, but she had you know about eight different personalities uh. that would emerge at different times, right. and I started feeling a bit like that you know, <laughs> because I had six different people living in my head, and they're all and, parts you of know, you too, like you said. Yeah, they, they and all... I, I would do things like um to to get to know them better you know if i was in a restaurant i would think hmm what would julian order off this menu and yeah. what would alice like to eat and you know i i would i would sort of they became they became my friends but it does it does slightly make you feel like you're going a bit crazy <laughs> <laughs> did you i guess it's like picking a favorite child did you have one character that com was was completely uh, you're just loved writing when you had to sit down and write that character and others that were much more challenging. 
Yeah, it is like choosing a favorite child. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think probably my favorite was Hazard the Addict mm-hmm. because he was, you know, his experience, although he's very he's different very from me in many ways, his experience was quite close to my own. Um, but uh, but I tell you, there's one character that I found most difficult to write, um, and that's uh, a character called Riley, who is a um, he's an Australian gardener, yeah. and and he is you know pretty perfect. He's gorgeous. He's young. He is um, happy go lucky. What you see is what you get. Um, a very uncomplicated sort of person. And I, I found him really tricky to write because he doesn't have a fatal flaw. You know, he doesn't have he's too perfect almost. And, you know, and, and I he's he felt the most removed from my own experience. So do you speak to other writers now about writing and do you do you have um, do people ask you questions about how you how you write? And I'm just wondering what advice you give to, you know, a lot of our listeners are aspiring writers or writers that haven't been published yet but want to be published or just love writing is there something that you could give them words of wisdom to uh yeah uh, i mean i i I think the my biggest advice would be to to write the story that you feel you have to tell and mm. not necessarily the one you think people want to hear because you know i think so often we you know, we worry about uh, you know what 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 are what's popular these days, and what what are publishers looking for, and and you know what are you know making the prose sound sort of you know uh, terribly erudite and and sort of clever. And actually, if if you start from that perspective, it's quite difficult to find your own voice. And if you start from the perspective of what's the story I feel I really need to tell, um, you'll end up. I think, with a much more powerful book at the end of the day, and it will feel much more unique and much more you. And that, I think, is what publishers are really looking for. They're looking for a voice that they haven't seen before, and that you are the only person that can write with your voice. Mm-hmm. How do you find that story that you have to tell rather than you than, than what you know the market is telling you? Ah, oh, it's. I, mean, I think so often it, it comes from your own experience. Mm. You know, it comes from sort of, um, you know, what you've been through in your own life. But you know, also, I, I find a very helpful starting point is to think what would happen if, you know, what would happen if, you know, the world was like this, or if somebody did that, or you know. Um, mm. So you know, I, I always have that question in my head: what would happen if? And that often leads to, you know some fabulous jumping off points. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, let's end on that. I love that. What would happen if? Claire, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's a pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for, thank you for talking to me. You're, you're about to go to bed and I'm about to get out of my pajamas. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I have an image of you in my <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. pajamas. Thank you for listening to Write About Now, hosted by my dad, Jonathan Small. If you like what you hear, you can support the show by becoming a patron. All you have to do is log on to Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Backslash Write About Now podcast and pledge as little as $5 a month to get all sorts of valuable information on how to be a better writer. You can also follow the show on Instagram and Facebook or check his website, at writeaboutnowmedia.com. Thank you for listening, and always remember to do the right thing. Yay.